It's Sunday, June 16, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is the former U.S. Attorney and Deputy Assistant Attorney General, a senior legal columnist for the L.A. Times and host of Talking Feds podcast. Harry Lippman, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thanks, Anthony. Good to be here. So um, could I just start by saying that I, I see the U.S. as quite lawless, <laughs> and that's certainly the evidence that I've seen recently when it comes to the disgraced former president, but it is also very litigious. Do you think there's any truth in the fact that the, that the law tends to be kind of, you know, people go down the route of rather suing each other than kind of taking personal responsibility? Just kind of an right. overarching question. No, no, no. It's a, so it's a really rich question, I would say. There, there, you really can't gainsay the uh, idea of litigiousness, right? We're all over that. And, you know, it goes to de Tocqueville and others have noticed it that way. On the lawless point, I think there may be that the, the landscape may be more complicated. We are seeing lawlessness at the very highest levels of one party of government, and that's striking. And one does think that, you know, in America, if, if that's, if that works for uh, these elites, then it's the general situation. But, you know, I think the law, this is the short lesson of the convictions in the New York's state court. I, I was at the trial in a sort of dilapidated, homely, yeah. regular old state court cold. in Manhattan. Don't forget but, how cold it was as well. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, varying, I think, would be. But anyway, um, you know, the, in fact, I think you'd find a lot of uh, people in society thinking that far from uh, lawless, the, the law's presence is, is strong and um, and very responsive. So I would just say, yeah, we're a litigious society. And as a former prosecutor, DOJ guy, that was the federal government, I, I, I would say that the uh, observations of lawlessness, which certainly are apt to the both the rhetoric and slightly perhaps the practices for a certain um, level of prominent uh, politicians in our, our midst, probably don't knock on wood, part of the yeah. stakes of what's coming up, apply more broadly to current American society. Because my, my feeling, and a lot of people I've spoken to feel that after January 6th, 2021, because Donald Trump very openly on television encouraged people to, to attack the US Capitol and brought about a coup against his own country, that really the very next day, if the country was lawful, he should have been led away in handcuffs because that was such an obvious, you know, breakage of of American law and also his oath of office. And yet here we are two and a half, three years later, and he still is, is evading any kind of, you know, legal consequences for that action. So true. Uh, I mean, I don't think we would think in a lawful society he'd be led away the next day. The wheels of justice grind a week, slowly, maybe, a and there week. has been a res <laughs> no, not even a week if you think of uh, the the ra the regular sort of half life of prosecutions, but certainly led away. And just that we are, at, I, I would certainly agree with you that notwithstanding what I just said, if there turns out to be no definitive lawful response to that most dangerous of you know any action by a president at least in since the civil war um if there turns out to be no response we are it's a big big strike against the u.s as a law-abiding society it's one of the reasons i think it's fair to say that the democratic experiment and the rule of law are really are at in play for the um election um so yeah it's a monumental test of the system and it's harrowing, isn't it, that that it seems to be up in the air, that there's a state of affairs where um, Trump win, re-wins the presidency, notwithstanding, right, a whole series of things, July, uh, January 6th being maybe prime among them, where sane people said, ah, okay, well, that's it, at least for Trump, and we've been proven wrong and wrong and wrong again. So all of that is certainly occasion for um, nail-biting uh, on, on a grand 
uh, scale. So, I, I, you know, I don't, the jury, as it were, um, is in doubt. Uh, it, 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 red accountability may still be coming, probably will still be coming, whatever the Supreme Court does and, you know, whatever the next few months hold, if Trump loses. Um, if he doesn't, though, you're right, it's squelched. And what of the, uh, the you know, the principles of, of you know, rule by law and not by, by men? I, I do think, you know, I try not to be too um, you know, alarmist or hyperbolic, but I do think we're kind of looking at that point like Turkey, Venezuela, whatever, not like the, uh, the um, you know, land of the free and the brave. You mentioned Trump's friends there in Turkey and Venezuela and, yeah, right. and anywhere else. These are the people that he, he, he respects. So, so with your experience... Emulates. Yeah. Emulates, indeed. And they emulate him, as is the case yeah. with, with yeah. Bolsonaro, for example, in Brazil. But, but just to your experience, let's just talk about why. Why does he slip through the fingers of justice? What is it about him? Is it the, the office of president that has that kind of cultural you know, disconnect or we can't touch that guy? Or is it the fact that, you know, he is a bully and, you know, arguably wealthy? I mean, that's definitely open to debate. But, and is it because he's white? I mean, I suppose let's come straight out with it. That that has yeah. something to do with it as well, doesn't it? Of your three hypotheses, I feel pretty certain in choosing uh, door, door number two. You know, he, he's, he's been a sort of laughing stock, I think, for much of his career in New York. He's been on the wrong side of the law a lot. Yeah, he's bullied and blustered opponent or, or business people uh, repeatedly and been a, a first class um, jackass. But the but what we're talking about here the the flagrant, breathtaking, and deeply damaging uh, dereliction of rule of law. That's that's because he stumbled stumbled. I mean, he he lost the popular vote, but uh, but he you know at at a minimum came very close to legitimately winning the presidency and maybe won it, and it could happen again. And that to me is the whole thing. There's a, a lot of um, this kind of goes back to the crown and the special place of a sovereign to do what you know what what he or she um, desires. We don't have that system exactly, but we have some cultural vestiges of it. And when if a totally corrupt buffoon, shameless, megalomaniacal, fill, fill in the blanks, person ascends to the presidency. You know, it turns out that's a kind of crisis that it's just not clear the Constitution can uh, survive or, or at least can respond to with vigor. So I, I think it's the happenstance, the, you know, horrible and kind of ridiculous, but it's not so funny, is it? happenstance that he happened to become president of the United States from which all of this followed. You worked under Bill Clinton. Back then, could you have imagined that we'd be in this situation now where the threat of a constitutional crisis, a presidential candidate and former president being worshipped like a king, in, you know, by libertarian people? I mean, that's re what's so remarkable, isn't it, that he's, he's basically been given the crown. Could, could you have imagined? I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, I truly couldn't have. I remember when George uh, uh, W. Bush replaced Clinton and, you know, I thought that was bad. Or I remember the, Ronald Reagan. But really, we're in a completely different category. And there's ongoing discussion about whether there's any analog in American history, possibly the Reconstruction, possibly the tur the turbulent 50s and 40s. But, you know, I've been, it's not simply, I mean, it's the point you made a couple of questions ago, Anthony, it's not simply him. I, I, I think we've probably had pretty, um, you know, feckless or selfish or superficial presidents, but the, the um, how he has managed to capture the party, uh, you know, right right now you have the Speaker of the House, you know, basically saying the conviction, the conviction, by the way, yeah. you know, when Spear Agnew a while back was convicted, it went without saying that he had to leave the office. I mean, all those sorts of things, the broad um, capture of it and the like, I don't think I could have imagined. I've been at the Department of Justice under Republican and Democratic rule. I've been 
at the policy levels of the Department of Justice under Republican and Democratic rule. And the, the kinds of things that he made routine were basically inconceivable. So, um, and then just in general, the whole kind of process of, you know, I talked about January 6th, but sort of started, I think, you know, at Access Hollywood with, well, now we've gone beyond the pale and it can't be. And there have been, what, 20 of those? And uh, no, I I would have, you know, as a betting person in 2013, well, I mean, among other things, I was I was hoping Trump would get the nomination in 2015. I'm a Democrat and I thought he would be so such a caricature of a figure. He'd be easy to take down. I mean, joke is on me and a lot of other people. The short answer to your question is. No way could I literally have imagined that the institutions and persons within the institutions of the federal government would be so susceptible to his I don't even think particularly intelligent or deft or strategic, just sort of strong man, bully, bully boy insistence. I'm, I, I find it uh, stunning and depressing and also very contingent. I mean, it has to do with the extremely um, divided and even, you know, I, I think um, the, the Republican Party's position that it can't really until it totally changes its act hope to, to get power other than with a minority strategy. And a lot of things had to come together other than this one uh, jerk off, jag off, as they would say in my hometown of Pittsburgh. <laughs> but um, still, I couldn't have, I, I think the true answer is I couldn't have imagined it. It's funny, isn't it? Because before Trump in 2016 or even 2015, when you know he was campaigning, people like you would reference Watergate and... Right maybe the impeachment of Bill right, Clinton. Which now looks for, like the apotheosis of lawfulness and right. the, the systems responding and holding, right? Yeah, amazing. And because Nixon was forced to resign, and he did. Can you and imagine, he did. Can you he imagine Trump being forced to resign? Right, right. I mean, Trump's the best thing that ever happened to Richard Nixon, right? You know, <laughs> it's it's yeah. really, he, he understood, I mean, at the time, I was a, you know, little... 16 year old hippie Nixon hater, but, but, and we, th people saw him as being forced out. But you're right. He could have, you know, I mean, Trump having plainly lost the election was talking about the military and all kinds of, you know, high theft and fraud with Congress, the sorts of things that Nixon never imagined. And I don't think we thought of it then. That's because of his, um, laudable personal qualities. It was just that's, America and the force of the culture here, but it turns out that that um, that strength is really um, contingent. I mean, it, it has, you know, I, it's definitely yielded, if not surrendered, to him in a lot of ways. So, right, I mean, Watergate now looks like, you know, the textbook of government crisis doing well. The army doesn't come out, and who the hell knows? you know, whether it would or wouldn't under, under Trump rule. And it really does. I don't know, you know, people much more sophisticated than I ha, uh, have, but have the view that if you look at, at history, it is a bit of a one way ratchet that when democracies lose their way, it's very, very hard. Poland might be a counterexample now, but very, very hard for them to claw their way back. So it really feels that it's not simply, okay, well, We'll endure it for a few years and maybe we'll all go to New Zealand or something. It really does feel like if he manages to, to base things and actually undermine what is essentially at the, at the end of the day, cultural, um, shared beliefs that, you know, we're kind, we're sort of kind of through or at least a quarter turn toward or a half turn toward, say, a turkey. Uh, it, it feels that way to me. Like what, if the inconceivable becomes the conceivable, what, how do you, how do you build it back up? I, I'm not sure you can. So he can't do it alone. And there are a, a number of enablers that he For has sure. not just installed, but people who have presented themselves. Let, let's talk about the, the Supreme Court for a moment, because... Can I just say one quick thing yeah. to that, Anthony? Yes, yes. Perfect example was yesterday and the, the holding hands of Mitch McConnell, 
who yeah. was who announced to the country that Trump was guilty on January 6th, but right. had a technical reason not to vote to convict. But if he is now kissing the ring, so there's just not a person who isn't. And that that is stunning. OK, but to the Supreme Court, please. Yeah, well, I, we should just say that it was the first time Trump had gone back to the U.S. Capitol since, since January, January right? 6th. Stunning, right? And his. And- they they yeah. kind of sang happy birthday to him because he he turned seventy. You know, compared him to Jesus, whatever. I, compared you know. him to Jesus, and want want to want to name the waterways after him. <laughs> uh, you're getting me worked up now. Okay, I'm right. sorry. I'm I'm, right. I'm reassuming my journalistic objectivity. It's, it's fine. Bring you, it you, on. Bring you, it on. You do you do you. <laughs> um, so so the Supreme Court is. Uh, it's only now that people are really starting to see the true colors exposed. And initially, a lot of the heat was on Clarence Thomas and his relationship with wealthy donors and, you know, ethics and all that stuff. And now, of course, we have a window on Samuel Alito's world as well, thanks to his wife flying a, a, a flag that was flown on January 6th and him initially blaming her. and 15th, we've discovered, but whatever, yeah. Right, we've now January, discovered yeah. through some secret recordings and some rather you know, epic journalism that, that actually they both have very, you know, far-right views. And then, of surprise, course, surprise. we can't not mention the three... Supreme Court justices that Trump crowbarred in in the kind of last moments of his pres- well presidency. Yeah. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett, belonging to some far right Christian sect yeah. or, or, or cult. Um, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, we, we know about. He was given a, a pass on despite allegations against him and, and, and Neil Gorsuch. These people are very much far right Christian nationalists. And as a result of their their views and their position, and we know about Leonard Leo, somebody who seems to be managing this gallery of curios, it is anything but apolitical. How does America go forward with a with a politically stacked Supreme Court where their colors are very much nailed to the mast? You know, I feel this really keenly. I corked there and sort of peers with a few of the people you've named. And I actually think uh, there's a sense in which all the focus on the ethical um, problems with Thomas and Alito have served, in fact, to dis- distract attention from what is the real um, problem. And to me, it's as you've put it, Anthony, I, I don't I don't necessarily uh, con- uh, condemn them to, you know, being raw politicians in the way some might think. But I, I, I know them. I've came of age with them, and I do think this is a uh, a trio, and now five, and maybe even six. I worked a little with John Roberts and DOJ that does have a kind of ideological um, allegiance to a, a view of American law that's I, it's respectable, but it really is extreme. That is, they all really do occupy. And more than occupy, there's a, there was a cultural movement in reaction to the sort of, you know, liberally, liberal monolithic jurisprudence. And it was for, you know, there was a time like when I was in school that conservative was a dirty word and they were really not respected. But the the um, pushback and reflex has been strong, and and the real problem with that court, uh, we could talk separately about you know either Thomas or Alito and ethics, but the real problem is five or six of them occupy a really narrow stra- stratum of American political thought. Now it's true that that thought is you know far away from mine, but I think I would adhere to this position, even if it weren't, you know, there's a complicated relationship that the court has toward majority politics and, and some of its most important work is quote unquote counter majoritarian. But when it's this far out of step with the, 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 the non-legal non-doctrinal, but just sort of uh, life, uh, expectations of the American people, it's a problem for the court and for the people. And to to go directly to your question, what do we do? You know, on every important question, because going back to your initial question, as de Tocqueville says, everything does wind up in the courts. 
uh, there is this, you know, final trump card, as it were, that the court can play. And that's just part of your strategy. You have to try to um, win before then. Uh, and there, I mean, there are things that that kind might mean or things in the political sphere, but essentially this most important and what Americans to date, maybe this is eroding, but take as the final, you know, word that settles things is, is going to be, if not a, uh, if not a rig game, it's going to be a really tilted one. And that matters in, in you know, in, kind of every every way and we're going to find it out you know in the next couple of weeks in spades with an Idaho abortion statute that seems to contradict federal uh, medical practice that says you've got to treat emergencies and it could yield I mean there's a lot of decisions big and small that to my mind are you know outrageously kind of di- ignoring of or contemptuous of a lot of law that came before it, and it's now a baked in feature and I'm sorry for like, I'm going to, I'm going to die with the, you know, with this very conservative court still in place. It's never, you know, they're, they're young, they're, and they're, you know, there, there are at a minimum th- uh, three or four. Uh, Justice Thomas himself said when he was appointed, they made me miserable for 43 years. I'll make them miserable for 43. And I think we still have about nine years on that sentence. So it's I, I don't I don't it's a real serious political problem or problem with in, in American self determination problem for people who want to chart their own path and ought to have liberty to do it within constitutional limits and this hidebound very narrow view of the Constitution that sort of slaps them around in in new ways it's it's a profound problem I'd say. There's nothing in the Constitution to suggest how many Supreme Court justices there should be, though, right? And so the argument to pack the court, which is what Donald Trump did, is potentially open to Joe Biden, maybe not in, in this term, but in a, in a future term or whoever will, will be the, the, the Democratic leader. Is, I mean, the is, argument is, is open. Option? Term limits are open. Um, there was a time when they were, holy shit, are they going to do it? And yes, they did in Dobbs when I found myself flirting with it. But the bottom line on this to me, Anthony, is it ain't happening. The, the, uh, you're right. We varied in numbers forever and, and, um, and nine is contingent and you could just stick in four and that would undo this. What, what really was in at least two out of three cases, a pretty damn illegitimate um, uh, grab by by Trump. Um, but the main thing is the the cultural um, legacy of the the Roosevelt um, ill fated attempt to pack the court is such that you're, you're just not gonna get. I think um, I I just don't see it happening. But uh, as between the two um, proposals that are bandied about increase the court which congress can do so there are there are there is an alignment of stars that that happens the um 18 month term which you can see making some sense and would in particular every president gets to and you take away the terrible um freight and sturm und drang of individual nominations that would take a um constitutional amendment you know the eras uh, fade in what's it now 50 years i mean you know what's involved there as long as we keep there's another let me just step back as long as we have basically this position where the you know the republican party is that given the the operation of the electoral college system and the way in which you know they're at what is it in terms of numbers in the country 42 and but they can just eke out uh, power majority rule in some ways, and they're just so at some point somebody's going to have to get guts in the Republican Party and say we got to go in the desert for a while and come back so we can remake ourselves as viable. But as long as they keep trying to um, cobble together power now, basically without any substance, just by you know having trashing them, you know, just by culture wars, etc., that kind of thing will not happen the kind of thing that requires a real national consensus you know it's it's so jets and sharks uh, mon- 
uh, Capulets and Montagues out there and just the, the reflexive feeling as if one side's for it, they're against it. You know, I grew up learning in fifth, oh, well, government's supposed to be divided and hard to do things, maybe, but not quite like this. It's, but it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's really impotent. Yeah. It, it's ahead. an issue of representation though, isn't it? And, and 100%. The, the, the Supreme Court yeah. numbers wise is not representative of the people. You could argue that the number of, of, of Congress people is not representative of the, of the people. You don't uh, have to argue it. I, okay, if well, you, let's, that's let's, our electoral let's college. Let's not argue. Yeah. Well, then it's, we could uh, also say that the electoral, yeah. the electoral college system is not representative of the people. Those stipulated. That's right. So, so, so what is representative of the people? Because as we've described it, there is no democracy in, in the United States. I mean, uh, well, 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 well. I, I think you just went and drove off the cliff for a second. I mean, well, you know, that, we're, fa- we're fond. <laughs> okay. <right. laughs> Look, we are fond of extolling and seeing the genius of the founders of the constitution <laughs> and for my money they did do a pretty damn good job so but it was a while like, ago a, wasn't it it was, it was a, a long ago. time yeah. ago and yeah. they fucked up in very important ways don't get me wrong but i'm just saying all of this is meant to be some kind of compromise between wise patrician rule and deimos you know sheer rule of the people it's not that doesn't make it exactly undemocratic but i I'll, I'll say this, the system that they put into play, when you overlay it with the, you know, really, um, uh, impacted and polarized po- broad political situation we have, and then a madman would be tyrant, uh, potentially at the helm. I agree. It sure doesn't work very well. And if we could have just lifted our finger and suspended the electoral college for the last 10 years, I do think the country, both sides of the country, it would have been really better off. It's easy for me to say as to both sides. But anyway, um, that's not that I, I, I won't. Um, and, and as I've said already, I think we're a threat of becoming undemocratic as demo, as democratic means in the American culture and legal system. I'm not ready to pull the trigger though on the constitutional system, including the electoral colleges that are being inherently undemocratic. Okay. We have to take a quick break, but I, right. I want to come back and, and talk about what's happened this very week with the Supreme Court rulings. Yeah. That's next on The Weekend Show. I'm excited to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink is a meat subscription box company on a mission to fight for the family farm. They're located in rural America, run by an eighth generation female farmer. Their animals are raised humanely, their employees are paid a living wage, and the quality of their product is better than anything you'll find in a store. Moink delivers grass fed and grass finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. I have received one of these boxes and I can verify that the quality of the food was excellent and it tasted delicious too. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash weekend now and listeners of this show get free bacon for a year. That's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash weekend. That's moinkbox dot com slash weekend. Ten seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base. How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling t-shirts and Midas Touch merch, and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. (coughs) Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, 
Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back on The Weekend Show with Harry Lippman. I'm Anthony Davis. The Supreme Court on Thursday threw out a lawsuit seeking to roll back access to mifepristone. Get that right. That's uh, one of the two drugs used in uh, medication abortions. Uh, Then we also heard about bump stocks this week uh, as well, uh, striking down the federal ban. Surprisingly, it was brought about by the disgraced former President Trump. Uh, That's the the latest opinion from from the conservatives. rolling back firearm regulations. We were also expecting to hear about, or uh, potentially, a ruling on Donald Trump's immunity case. That didn't come on Friday, as some people were expecting. So that could now come, what, next week or or the week after. Let's deal with these issues one at a time and start start with with, uh, abortion. The way I saw it, this was the Supreme Court kind of playing games and being like, okay, we'll give them this, but give the people a full sense of security, knowing full well that in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to make Donald Trump immune from all of his crimes. Let's see. I mean, that is a a particularly nefarious turn on it. I'll start here. I thought this case was always going to come out as it did. And to the extent you're having headlines, oh, that that um, surprising Supreme Court, nine nothing embracing a progressive result. Uh, you know, I always thought that was fanciful. It was fast fanciful because what you had here, you have one circuit, even uh, with the current court that is, you know, off off the reservation. And they've had a few cases last year that they just had to be slapped back on. And one district court judge, by the way, who started the whole Mifepristone uh, problem, who's, uh, you know, a madman and an an activist. But in their standing jurisprudence, which they take seriously and they ought to, it's, you know, they want to have people in front of them who are really injured, not just ideological opponents. This was a ridiculous claim. Emergency room doctors say, well, uh, if if, uh, somebody comes in and has to have an abortion because she tried mefepristone and I, I mean, they tried so hard to gin up some kind of theory and it really was going nowhere. And I wasn't at all surprised that it was nine zip. And as you say, it doesn't say anything about a properly brought if they can find the plaintiff who's actually injured by it. I mean, that's part of the whole deal here. Who, why, why should you care so much? Why do people care? They care because this is now the uh, method of choice for over half the abortions in the country. It's also one that can survive if surreptitiously uh, any kind of draconian state regulation, because you can still get it in the mail and without a doctor's visit. They, that's one of the um, sort of um, relaxations that the um, that is under challenge the FDA did. Um, but, uh, they, and they haven't ruled on, on the merits, but, uh, to the extent this plays as in some ways, you know, not so, uh, pro abortion, it's just, all it is, is a affirmation of the most, um, you know, basic kind of, uh, point that you need actual an injury to, to, to come up here. So that, um, that's how I read it. That's how I expected to read it. That's how we, I talked about it when it first came up and, you know, I, I, I think in terms of the overall drama that we're talking about of the court in American society, Anthony, it basically is a, a blip or a nothing. Of course, it does mean that right now and going forward, mefepristone, it remains 
available as part of that, you know, two drug cocktail. But it's that being really framed is. as a as a win and and that's for right. abortion and that's rights people. Yeah, that's and, that's and, a mistake. But that's the media, isn't it? You know, that's that's the the kind of media that's, play. Hey, into we've this. met the enemy, and they are us. You know, you've read Pogo. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's hard, by the way. You know, I'm like, sim. I don't feel like the media, but you know, like with the trial that I just attended. You know, every all these criticisms and trying to rebut what people are saying on the right, they're so benighted. There's, they, you know, they weren't there. They don't see it at all. But it ain't easy, and that's beside the whole point of why the media which is you know has a lot as an economic model seems to be failing why it seems to so often lurch toward a you know sensational but not very accurate portrayal of events we could that's add a that part to the of list. what's going on here yeah exactly. we add it to the list of the fall that, of that, democracy that's, <laughs> yeah that's that the short answer is yeah. yes i mean in other yeah. words what, what's going on here and how did trump manage to be here? Uh, just a big part of it is all those voters, they they they're on social media. They're yeah. not on, and <clears throat> that's a hunk yeah. and huge problem. But not what you brought me on to talk about. So no, I'm no, sorry. You want uh, bump stocks? You wanted to go? For well, yeah. Let's let, let, let's look at the the, yeah. the next issue, which is which is bump stocks. I mean, this is a this was a a, a kind of remarkable announcement. It, this came off the back of the Las Vegas shooting, which fell during Donald Trump's presidency. And and for those that don't know, the bump stock is like a, an attachment that enables you to fire multiple rounds in 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 minutes by keeping your finger on the trigger. So it just turns a, a regular multiple try four hundred to six hundred in a minute. Okay, and this so, guy in Vegas within minutes wounded five hundred, killed fifty eight. So it's totally true. It was also totally true that it was kind of a um, uh, it played as a very sort of dry regulatory interpretation. You know, I've never used a bump stock. I have used as part of my press guitar background, you know, uh, been to shooting ranges and the like. But anyway, it seems like a very academic argument because once you learn the trick, you do this as you do with a machine gun, you mow everyone down. But the the statute talks about operation of the trigger and justice thomas's opinion had eight diagrams to explain why what's really going on is you're actuating or um uh, triggering you know hundreds of actions with one push of the finger and that's what mattered to the dissent so to my or read from the bench doesn't happen very much but does happen in june that like come on you know this is a uh, machine gun by any other name now the answer uh, is, you know, you can, it's a, it's a dry antiseptic, you know, uh, valid, I think on the majority's part, uh, interpretation as would have been the other, but what you normally do then two, two points that really remain. What normally happens there is you defer to expertise from agencies and part of the whole Supreme Court project is to, is a real hostility toward these agencies, which they see as captured and kind of inherently lefty or whatever. So, and especially the ATF, you know, slapping down the ATF doesn't get better on, on most days for conservatives. That's one. And then two, this thing like Justice Alito of all things, uh, you know, I, this is not his style normally. Maybe he's feeling the heat, writes the little three paragraph concurrence that says, Oh, it was tragic what happened in Vegas, but this is now up to Congress. But that is kind of a joke because everybody knows I, this is, this is even a, um, exaggerated version of the undemocratic point you're making. Because even taking account of, you know, many conservatives would be in favor of regulating this stuff. And the real failure of government is the capture by a much smaller cohort of, you know, money lavishing um, gun uh, lobbyists. So that no way in hell that this extremely obvious, easy, good government uh, enactment to say you can't use a machine gun or by by any other name is going to happen. So this is, it goes also to your other point, Anthony, we're at the end of the road now. AT, you know, ATF can't do it now and Congress won't do it. Supreme Court was really the only hope. 6-3 says no. We're fucked. Sorry. As a, as a practical matter, even yeah. though legally as a matter of, you could make this, in, you know, legislative interpretation, a nice kind of academic debate in class. What, ta what the majority said is not ludicrous to me, but, you know, 
we're fucked. Sorry, go ahead. What what does that say to the other national conversation about removing weapons of war off the streets as per the, right. the, the ban years ago, which did actually see mass shootings go it's down? It's a weapons ban, yeah, oh, for sure. Does does this change the, the, the conversation on that issue too? I don't think so. I mean, I think it just, you know, reinforces it. We're in a situation where the kinds of things that are permitted in some states and potentially the Supreme Court might even find constitutional entitlements to, but even if they wouldn't, um, they the ability to move things in the direction that a plain majority of the country would like. I mean, we are such outliers in the civilized world in terms of the number of guns, the likelihood, homicide and suicide, the likelihood oh, yeah. of people's dying as a result of guns, et cetera. You know, there's no, there's no comparison to us. The more guns than people, it's all crazy, but it's the, um, I think the, the vestige, not of a weirdly, uh, distorted polity worked up by the Donald Trump. It's rather much more sort of narrow and sinister influence by lobbyists that, you know, you could look to cases like Citizens United or other that, that, that enable that regime. But it's a, this, I would say, you know, is a, is a flaw in democracy that just didn't, didn't have, it wasn't part of the, the, the landscape, you know, in 1789. But it's so, it's, it's the regular anti-democratic problem you think of, it's torqued over like two standard deviations because it really is a hammerlock control of a distinct minority of American society as against a distinct majority that has kids in school and just doesn't want to see this crap as part of American life. And, and when you see survey... more than one assault shooting, uh, you know, defined by two or three debt, whatever yeah. per, so far, I, four, at least the last time the, I checked four, including no, 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 but I'm saying more than one a day, yes. depending on how, yeah, that is mind boggling. I remind my American friends that in the UK, the police don't even carry guns. Right, and right, And right. They, they just can't quite understand that. Um, yeah. When, when you survey Americans nationally, though, there is, even from gun owners and conservatives, there is a desire to see gun safety legislation. That, that is, it comes right. out that way in all, all the surveys. It's right. the same with abortion. That, that people believe in a woman's right to choose and, and, yeah. and women's rights. when But it's nationally. really true with guns, some of these crazy-ass gun things that are right. permitted in states. It's You know, the NRA really does take the position. Well, yes, I agree. I'm sorry. And so, and so this is the differential when we talk about representation, whether it be in Congress, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the, the, the voices of American people are not represented in the, in the halls of Congress or, or in the seat of power. Um, how does, Agreed. how does that change going forward? I mean, is it the case that the only way to change it is to get a, a kind of a three way win, uh, executive branch, Congress, Senate for Democrats, get all this legislation in place, pack the court, and <laughs> do a runner because yeah. I, I can't really see another way around it. So I'm not sure that's true. The different the different mechanisms you name could do it themselves, right? If, if the Supreme Court had ruled otherwise, that would have been the end of the matter. But so what do you do with this really um, anti-democratic kind, kind of arrangement? You could do things, but I think they're, they're pretty much foreclosed by the Supreme Court just getting at corporate power and, and dollars and stuff. But um, I think what's happening, I, you know, I am on the Brady Leadership Council in the country and in the, with so many legal institutions kind of failing us in this respect, there is a kind of cultural move afoot, isn't there, I, that was maybe overall successful with cigarettes, which for a time seemed as powerful, where the NRA, you know, has been... Um, I think discredited a lot. Wayne LaPierre is what is he is he in jail or somehow he's, he's you know he's, he's known to be a thief. Yes. And uh I do think they're you know they're in worse humor. It's got a long way to go, but because you would have to get them to a place where 
you know, I, I think the average Republican um, senator would not take $2 million now from Philip Morris. Uh, and, you know, could could you uh, maneuver things so it would be the same for firearms? That seems to me in the kind of um, absence of government to step up. In, and it's totally right. It's representative of a majority position, but it gets foiled for these reasons. So... I think the most effective, and it doesn't seem impossible to me, but it's a damn shame that this is the way one has to try to go, and it's a long-term project, but it's to basically make the the gun industry sort of, um, you know, outlaws, uh, as they ought to be. But, um, you know, and I I do have to say, I have a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of friends who are conservatives. I really respect can respect and get next to their views with the exception of this one. I honestly, I I understand why it might be kind of fun or you think important to have a gun or even one to defend yourself, but the kinds of things that they are reflexively for, at least the gun industry, and, you know, they will fight to the tooth and nail against that seems so sensible. I literally don't understand what are in, what's in their head that they think this is, you know, every hill is worth dying on. I, I pretty much concede. I don't understand the, the enemy here. And that makes it harder to advise what ought to be done. But, but I think some cultural assault on the gun industry, you know, is happening, ought to be happening more robust. And best, of course, would be a quick legal solution. But there's so many ways in which that's barred. Maybe you know. the Democrats need to make clear that they don't want to take people's guns away because that's been the rhetoric for the last 30, 40 years, right? Yeah. They're coming for your guns. They're coming, but yeah. they never do come for your guns. And, and maybe no. the and there's so many needs guns. You, you, we could start to take them away. And it's yeah. still, yeah, I, I, you know, I always, I, I'm always suspicious of, of um, answers or solutions that just go to, oh, the poor democratic messaging. I mean, maybe, but. I think Democrats have been saying that a lot. I, I, I don't think it's just poor messaging. There is some kind of cult of, there, there is the NRA for starters. And then there is, as I say, I just don't understand, some really deeply, deeply held kind of Second Amendment principles by people in the country that you're also fighting uphill against. I don't, I don't fully it's, understand. It's the it, Wild it's so, West. It's so it clearly should yield. I mean, you know, the public... Health, the and for you know, the 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 number of parents and children who send their kids to school with genuine fear every day, it's appalling. It's just appalling, and and I just don't see the weight of the interest on the other side that should somehow trump that. But I'm I'm obviously the wrong guy to 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 think about. I'm hopelessly like you know, uh, partisan here. I, I heard an, uh, an interview on the radio on NPR with a company that is destroying firearms. So they, they take guns yeah. off the street. They, rem- they strip out a component that is essential yeah. and they destroy it. And they've invented a machine for, for pulverizing it. And so the interview right. was, was about that. And then the interviewer said, so what do you do with the other bits of the gun? Oh, and they yeah. said, we sell them on eBay. And I heard this, Harry, and I was like, this is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and then I right. did investigation into what this company, who they were, what they were about. And of mm-hmm. course they were, they were very much on the right and it was a, a cover, you know, to basically get more guns out there. And we know about ghost guns as well. People 3d printing Th- guns. That by the way, ghost guns, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know if your listeners know about that, but where do you go when, when those become right. uh, actually prevalent? You know, I, I did a lot as a prosecutor. I focused a lot on gun crimes, uh, especially because I thought they were really useful in the federal uh, system. And we had all kinds of tools then. And between the uh, sort of conservative antipathy toward the ATF and just the new technology that's outstripping it, it's really gotten harder and harder. It just should not be that way that the good guys are so, you know, at best, at a at a um, tie point with the bad guys in the tug of war, it it it's ridiculous. But Uvalde was a very good example of how that is an yeah. untrue because the good guys with the guns were too scared to go in, and and waited in the corridor whilst the children were massacred. I mean, you know, 
if that wasn't a, a line in the sand, I don't know what, and yet it's mm. come and gone and, 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 you know, we had the resignation of the police chief. I mean, they always come it. and go, right? That's what yeah. you see it all the time. And, and you have the Republicans, you know, say, well, it's, this is a terrible human tragedy, but criminals kill people, guns, don't, whatever. Ill. And you just know it's going to fade. That's the yeah. thing. That, I mean, really, really, really terrible events happen. They're about as bad as they get sort of suddenly in American society. And you just know, jaded as we are after this has happened enough, that like in a week, you know, it's going to be off the uh, the radar screen. And really... I, right. Doesn't the day have to come where maybe not, but it feels to me, I feel this about abortion too, actually. I think, you know, the, uh, there will be a day we, we can't be that out of step with the rest of the world. There will be a day when that's a, again, when that's a constitutional right, but it might take a while. And, and doesn't there have to come a day when this lunacy has passed with, with, um, guns and that's how we'll regard it as lunacy. You know, I, I um, it, it, we are so out of step with the rest of. of I'm the pleased world. you mentioned the rest of the world because you know I I come to the, yeah. these conversations with a European perspective, right. where things like abortion are enshrined in law and, and 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 not up for discussion. It's just normal. But in some states, in some states, they're kind of. But nothing's like guns. Nothing's like guns yeah. in the rest of the world. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting because maybe this is also part of the problem is the failure to look outside of America by nature of the yeah. scale of the nation, the power yeah. of the nation, that actually yeah. these, these smaller countries yeah. don't really matter when in fact they yeah. are 20, 30, 40 years ahead in many ways. In many, it's really such an interesting cultural debate. Americans just don't like other examples and forget about guns and abortions. So many countries are ahead of us in happiness. Yes. That ought to matter, right? Yeah. I mean, that really right. ought to matter if we're, if, you know, the American way, it, you know, could be, could be made a lot more, you know, satisfying and content for, for Americans. So, you know, there, there, there does feel to me when I try to analyze and I, I'm scratching my head about what's going on in Trump, et cetera, that there, it does feel like it's coming from a dark, unhappy place, as it were, as opposed to like a Ronald Reagan uber conservative happy place or whatever and it, it it feels like a lot of sourness in the country and um you know i i i think this is the greatest country ever uh and uh i love 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 this country but you know god we could be happier and we're not as an aside so, yeah why do you think this is the greatest country because, you know, it's attitude of possibility and anything uh, can can happen. It's general decency of of the sort of shared principles. It's kind of of, um, you know, it, it's lack of effeteness. It's, you know, like baseball and hot dogs and all that stuff combined with the greatest universities in the country i mean in the world maybe uk accepted whatever uh you know it's it uh, to me it's it's so i'm jewish it's the best place ever for jews in in 2000 uh years obvious problems remain it hasn't been well, a great I, I'm, I'm uh six months <laughs> but yeah. but you know so i just i i you know i love i really do i love the country uh and um the uh and the prospect that that in some really important basic ways. Also, the choice of everyone, the diversity of it. And I mean, in the basic way of what kind of life do you want to live, and where do you want to live it, and the, the the you know the ability for freedom by going here or there. Whereas I think of many other countries that I love, and if you know that'd be fun, that'd be fun to live in as being much less broad and and. Um, subject to you know different different lifestyles and different people there uh, should we should we all sing oh. yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I i think the star spangled banner is a particularly pretty poem actually
as a poem, but yeah. I, I just think it's because you know I I struggle with yeah. it because I chose to yeah. move here and bring my family yeah. here, and I left a yeah, country. Yeah, yeah, you right. come over here right, and you exactly. insult our ways. That's right, you and damn people, Brit. And people do write to me and they say, "Well, why should you have an opinion on on the U.S.? Right. You're not right, even right, from right, here." Right. Yeah. So, so I'm always interested to know yeah. why Americans feel that it's the greatest country yeah. in the world saying it yeah. is one thing but but feeling it is another I, and, I, yeah. and i'm not here to argue it although i would say oh, no all, no no what's the point right, right. yeah but like, i would say that like all of the things do, that you listed yeah. resolve are this house believes america is not the greatest country right, in the world. right, right exactly <laughs> right. but i would yeah. say that all of the all of those things that you listed are available in in most european nations and they feel the same and i suppose all are being, available to yeah, the same yeah. Degree, you would say? Oh, that, I'd like to have a longer yeah. conversation about that. Okay. So would I, but we'll do that yeah. on another occasion. Another, We've got to right. take another quick yeah. break, and, and then I want to come okay. back and talk about Donald Trump's future uh, cases, not to mention uh, Eileen Cannon and the, and the uh, espionage case of stolen okay. classified documents. That's next on The Weekend Show. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive, and it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work and family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. I myself had a whitening procedure in the dentist chair several years ago. It was kind of painful, I didn't really enjoy it, and it didn't seem to last. Well, 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves and crannies to get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips or trays or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery, plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. We're back on The Weekend Show with Harry Lippman. I'm Anthony Davis. Uh, the federal judge overseeing Donald Trump's prosecution on charges of retaining classified documents agreed on Monday this week to expunge from the indictment a paragraph about an episode in which the disgraced former president waved around a classified document at his Bedminster Club in New Jersey. Of course, we're talking about U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump-appointed judge, and she ruled she would strike the paragraph because Trump was not charged with a crime for the conduct it described and said it would be unfairly prejudicial if a jury later saw it at trial. Harry, how did you feel when you heard that, uh, in addition to the fact that Eileen Cannon seems to have been ducking and, and, and diving as much as possible to delay and prolong this period, clearly beyond the election? She's an unmitigated mess, but in her very long list of both, but I think you're right. Can only we can only see as patent uh, delays and and uh, ducking and bobbing, uh, and flat out blunders. This is a pretty small one. I, it, it's it's illogical in the sense that the uh, episode is likely to come before the jury, so the excision from the indictment seems a little meaningless. But what they did. What she did here, well, so the, to me, it was far less uh, worrisome than two other things she did in that opinion alone. The the first is that she, um, it's, it's a little complicated, but not that complicated. So in New York, everyone's screaming at the about the case because they say they, they didn't actually say what the predicate crime was. That's just complete um, uh garbage is a legal argument. They, that was about in New York, the means and the Supreme Court has held 
look, there are elements of a crime and then there are means like assault with a deadly weapon. And whether it's the gun or the knife, the jury doesn't have to agree on. In the same way, there are there's a count, count 34 here, that where there are two different means. And she just said it has to be decided unanimously, just a complete departure from Supreme Court um, law. But she says that at trial, because the the even more consistent feature of her um, absolutely mucking up the case is these repeated suggestions that she'll do this kind of mischief at trial in a way that could favor Trump and make retrial impossible under the double jeopardy clause. So if she makes this mistake and the jury takes it seriously and they apply what she tells them and they come back with a not guilty verdict, even if it's legally flawed, they're, you know, a not guilty verdict, they can't, they can't revisit as, um, as opposed to, but, and let me just say quickly in New York, if, if he wins on appeal, they can retry him. So she has again and again done what, what just, it just seems impossible to, to uh, indulge any other hypothesis and that she's trying to just delay things, but never actually make a holding that the DOJ could then use to appeal to the um, court above her and couple it with a motion to recuse her. And they already have a pretty good predicate for starting because of the way back at the beginning of the case, she did that whole misadventure with the, you know, bringing in for a normal search, the special master and having all this, just complete, complete uh, elementary blunders. But she, so she's now, happened on this strategy of uh, just not ruling. And she, at the same time, she, you know, rattles her saber all the time about all the trouble she could make at trial when it really would, you know, would, would effectively kill the case. She is a really first class mess and it's what it's the case. I, I don't think it's the most important case in terms of you know, political social history. That's the January 6th case. But it is open and shut, and it doesn't have the counter argument of somehow you're you're going after political activity. It, he's just a you know a bandit going going in the vault, taking the money and not giving it back. It's, he's so red-handed, and if any halfway competent or just honest judge uh, were trying uh, the case, it, it would have long since been tried and convicted, and pretty serious penalties. She's she's a disaster. Trump loves her though, doesn't he? I mean, he keeps saying think? that she's yeah. a she's a really he said that really good judge in Florida. In contrast, he criticizes Juan Merchan in Manhattan, and and he's you know it's a terrible judge, conflicted. And then the moment he talks about Eileen Cannon, what a wonderful judge! He literally, I mean, you couldn't. He, he says all the quiet parts yeah. out loud. Exactly. That's so true. I mean, including the plans for what he wants to do if he's reelected, but it's so true. And you think, well, he couldn't possibly be so crass as <laughs> yeah. to say, I don't know, put her on the Supreme court. Yes, he could. Yeah. Right. He, yeah. I mean, it just doesn't, it's always the, the, the things that motivate him are always very clear and she could well be thinking, okay, uh, let, what do I got? Let's say it's a 10 to one shot. Let's say it's a two to one shot. Let's say, God forbid, it's even money uh, shot of, being on the Supreme Court and a big shot all my life, or if, if the other guy wins, I'm going to be reviled forever and maybe the most, you know, one of the most hated district courts. Of life. Which way am I going to, you know, yeah. put, where am I going to put my chips? Well, she it's has more a, experience you know, than Amy Coney Barrett, and she managed to get uh, on, <laughs> on, on the bench. So it's there clearly not, yeah. not an issue of, ex yeah. of experience. So, so people ask me, and I'm sure they ask you all the time, you know, which is going to be the case that's going to nail Trump? And, and, the problem we have here is that it's an election year, and this is the same issue that we had with COVID coming out on an election year. That's right. It meant that, that, you know, things change. People's attitudes change with regard to, to timing. Donald Trump cared more about uh, the election than he did COVID in, in, in 2019. And so, you know, it, it's like history repeating itself, only it's different this time because there's also the threat of a fascist dictator taking over how, how do you qualify that when people ask you that question about how you know what's going to be the one case that brings him down yeah i mean we thought it was i mean this look one i try gone. to do it straight it's weird that I'm, i've even found myself in this position but i don't try to 
influencer chain saying, I just try to educate. And the answer is there isn't going to be a case before the election that brings him down. We've had the one trial that we're going to have. People should appreciate, I had a piece in the Atlantic on this this week that like, there's there's more to come collateral consequences and repercussions from the New York convictions. For yeah. instance, at the probation inter- interview this week, he had to fess up. He never would have otherwise. He's got a gun in Florida. And guess what? Felons in possession of guns. That's a crime. Now, you know, he may have arguments, et cetera. But I'm just saying if he gets put on probation, uh, you, you know, that that has immediate consequences. So that that is always going to be there, I think, to plague him. If he wins uh, the election, you know, the two federal cases are shut down immediately. And then Fulton County is a very troubled case, isn't it? If he loses those two cases, though, they're not going to they do. They're going to still need somehow to oust Cannon. But those cases are there as and the New York five year probation, et cetera, which is going to get them kind of all of them. And let me I don't say that kind of you know, triumphantly or gleefully the, uh, I got, I got a star turn on Fox news for calling the, you know, for extolling the New York case, but, but, you know, completely misinterpreted. I was saying the operation of the rule of law was a cause for celebration. Um, I could see a perfect world in which a philosopher King way back when would have said, okay, Trump, here's the deal. Go away, never come back. And you don't have to go to jail. But we're past that point now because of different political maneuvers and the ideal of uh, applying the law to all persons. He's looking at, you know, I, I said this and it was like a, another kind of big uh, thing that, that swirled around. But to me, it's just math. He's, uh, the, I stand by what I said last week to Al Frank, and he's got an appreciable chance of dying in prison if he's not elected. Those cases aren't going anywhere. They really do have big penalties. And once you're a criminal, as he is, shit happens and things tend to compound. So if the system really does intend to treat him in, as the pedestrian criminal he is, you know, if he doesn't win, it's just it's not going away. Even if he wins, by the way, I, I think the Supreme Court would and should find that the, the, the New York's thing, for example, has to be suspended. But if he's sentenced to prison, it will come back after he, you know, after he finishes his term. It's an interesting question. He turns 78 today, maybe. Right. And um, uh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. He turned 78 a few days ago. Sorry. But um, uh, he is, um, you know, Biden's the old guy. I was just at this trial. I want to tell you, he is not a healthy 78 year no. old. On yeah. the other hand, and I look, I don't wish him, you know death. But on the other hand, I gather uh, his, you know, genes, uh, you know, his parents have lived long, whatever. But um, he's he's not, uh, you just have to take one look at him, like at the unnatural color and shape. The guy's not a healthy 78 year old. Well, he he's also demented. I mean, that's the other thing that-, that There's that. Really... And, and I really do think, again, not trying to be snarky or triumphant, I, I was, I just taped my podcast with, with, um, Rick Wilson, who, you know, is, is master of kind of, of, uh, of humiliating him, but he genuinely believes. And I think a lot of people genuinely believe, you know, he's really lost it since you, you think of him in 2015 when he seemed to have a little bit of spring in his step and a kind of creative nastiness, you know, that whole like shark old battery deal yeah. from a couple of days ago, you know, He's he is kind of, he's got, you know, once a week he has these moments of of you know senility or, or it would seem. Yeah. So there's that as well. Yeah, I agree. So uh, for my money, the dynamic yeah. duo, if we're looking at goodies versus baddies, is yeah. Tanya Chutkin and Jack Smith together. I kind of uh-huh. feel like it's funny, isn't it, how we don't get to see much of any of these people. There's like two pictures of Tanya Chutkin floating around, one picture of Eileen Cannon, which is pretty scary with like big guys. The hoot owl, whatever. Right, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing these people in, in real right. life. And we've heard Jack Smith speak a couple of times, and both times I was like, oh, okay, he's, he's that guy. But yeah. I, I do get a sense that in the same way that we put a lot of faith into the Robert Mueller investigation. Yeah. And we were like, oh, you know, he's he's very professional. No leaks coming out of the office. He's going to nail him. And then tragically, right. that, that 
thanks to Bill Barr, that turned out to be a... Uh, a thanks to a lot of things. But, right, but, yeah, but, but Mueller the, the, already the, wasn't who we thought he was. That's right. And, I, I don't, and he know, wrote, anyway, rewrote yeah. the narrative like 20 minutes before, yeah. the, before it was released. But, yeah. but in, in this situation, we, we've got a special counsel who, you know, formally trying criminals yeah. in The Hague. He, he's the right man for the job. But he needs to be given and the opportunity. And she's the right woman. I, I'm here to right, tell you, that right case is not going away. I think in a couple of weeks, you're going to find the court really hacking at, hacking at it. But there'll be a torso that remains. And, and now the, the whole time factor goes away if we're not going to make November. And that's right. So even if Cannon completely gums it up and, and gives them an acquittal, even if... Uh, uh, the Fulton County case uh, never comes, and Fonnie Willis never comes back to life. Even if New York is a is a slap on the wrist, that January sixth case is there. It ought to be there, by the way. It is the most serious, flagrant, pernicious thing he, maybe any president, ever has done. And unless he is in a position to uh, just order it, you know, killed in a way, by the way, that. Uh, Joe Biden could have done this week against Hunter Biden. It's right. set, the contrast being so stark. Yeah. That case is not going away. And um, the penalties are serious. But more than that, the story, when it comes out on the witness stand, is so critical and really not fully fleshed out. That's going to be the most important moment of accountability that we have in this country. Thank God we had the January 6th committee, but the Jack Smith can do so much more. He's had people in the grand jury. That case, it's a damn shame. I agree, won't happen before November, but it's going to happen unless, of course, um, Donald Trump wins the presidency. And if he wins, he would appoint a favorable attorney general to pardon yeah, no, yeah, him. Yeah, he would just say, yeah. scuttle this case now. Pardon himself, he can't, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, he just says, hey, that case, shut it down, you know. And it's a half hour later, it's done. So finally, just some predictions for timeline. Yeah. Because I mm -hmm. think people are a bit confused because there are so many cases Why and there not? are yeah. so many kind of AGs involved and, and various characters. H how do you see it playing out with, with obviously November as a, as a line in the sand? Yeah. So I think the Supreme Court is going to issue an opinion in the next two or three weeks, and it's going to affect materially the January 6th prosecution. I don't think it's going to suggest or give Trump any kind of ultimate defense to the charges, but it might trim the charges. And I think, sad to say, besides the possible legal damage, it will occasion potentially another round back and forth. It will mean, we'll look at it then, there are people who have these optimistic views, there can still be an evidentiary hearing, even if not a trial. I don't share them, but... It, it depends how they write it, but I, I think it will be clear enough after that there is no trial before November. But Jack Smith, I think, will take the, what the Supreme Court says, hack away at the controversial stuff, present Judge Chutkin with what remains, and they will be off and running. And I see that case going to trial, say, a year from now, again, if, if, uh, if, if Trump doesn't win. Cannon be, is a wild card, but she's got to make some rulings. And if they, you know, are blunders as she's wont to do, they need to really dislodge her from the case. So, but I, I see if they do that, that case happening similar to, well, within a few months after she's dislodged. Bonnie Willis in Georgia strikes me as being very caught up in Georgia politics that are yeah. a very royal and be very hard to understand. I'm not confident that case um, is ever re revived and it'll have everything to do with what the court of appeal says in the appeal they've now taken and green lighted about the decision that seems plainly right to me not to have recused her. But I have to take that as far from certain. And we've had what New York has, except it will provide a long tail of oversight and, and liberty impingement on Trump just from the probation, et cetera. So the short answer to your question is Trump wins. We're fucked. Trump loses. You know, 2025, middle of the year, that kind of thing. Serious cases that aren't going away. Okay. Thank you. We have to finish, but I'm, I'm so thrilled for yeah. your analysis and your expertise, Harry Littman. 
Thanks. Good to be here, Anthony. It was fun. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. See more of me on the 5-Minute News YouTube channel. And I'll be back next Sunday with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News weekend show with Midas Touch. <laughs>